Here's another one of those barbed wire ecotones. Uh, they, a lot of people talk about how the introduced uh, Mediterranean grasses supposedly destroy the flowers. What could be causing this? Why are they, why are the flowers and the grasses coexisting here and not here? I wonder why. Okay, beneficial effects. Okay, invasionists often claim that adding species to a diverse ecosystem can cause its collapse into a simplified species poor one, calling this invasional meltdown. On the contrary, a, there was a lake in Africa that had an extremely simplified ecosystem. It had lots of flamingos, two species of algae, and a couple of invertebrates. Someone introduced a single species of fish and the ecosystem suddenly exploded into greater diversity with 30 species of fish eating birds alone arriving in this cascade of diversification. And of course, once the birds arrive, they carry things on their feet and you have much, much greater diversification. Okay, uh, a lot of these things as Symptoms, they heal uh, damaged, eroded areas, they build, build soil, they provide alternate habitat. Uh, the zostera is a, uh, a, a non-native seagrass in Northern California that supports a more diverse uh, set of species than the native. Uh, alternate prey, uh, rats are a, the favorite food of the native Galapagos hawks. Uh, sometimes they help the regeneration of the native ecosystems, like uh, horses spread seeds. There's an invasive uh, non-native solanum that occurs in abandoned Amazonian farmland that because it has fruits, it draws uh, fruit-eating birds and bats from the rainforest, which then drop the seeds of uh, rainforest species, which causes, it's, it, it, they create nu nuclei of new forest uh, spreading out from that. Uh, oh, lessening eutrophication. This is the zebra mussel. It completely, it cleaned the totally polluted uh, water of Lake Erie and allowed uh, native water plants to return. Uh, it, I believe it, in, it increased the catch of the native yellow perch fivefold after it, after it invaded. What do you know about the water mussel? Uh, I haven't studied that one, but I'd imagine it's the same, the same story. Another thing that they don't ever tell you, invasion increases biological diversity in all cases, including the oceanic islands. In all cases, man's movement of species has increased both alpha diversity, which is the, is the count of the number of species uh, in, uh, at, at the site or in the ecosystem, it increases beta diversity, which is the rate of change of species composition as you travel across the landscape. It's increased phylogenetic diversity, which is the, uh, the clades. That's like the different branches of the tree of life. Uh, they, they never tell you about that. Okay, these are some rare threatened and endangered species that have been naturalized in new areas. There are many of these, this uh, Delinix regia. It's so common in Mexico, most Mexicans will tell you that it's a native Mexican tree. It was discovered as a single specimen in Madagascar in the 1800s. And of course, uh, I'll, I'll cover some more of these. Okay, yeah, the first casualty when war comes is truth. Okay, scientific misconduct. Okay, let me try to catch up here. Okay, there's this often quoted fact that you'll hear is that invaders are the second greatest cause of extinction or the second greatest threat to biodiversity. Uh, that's completely false. Friend of mine, Matt Chu at University of Arizona, uh, investigated the origin of this claim, traced it back, I think, to E.O. Wilson, who just basically pulled it out of his hat. Subsequent studies have found that uh, invaders uh, barely even affect just a few percent 
of endangered species, much less cause extinctions. Yeah, less than 6% of endangered species were even affected by introduced species, and that includes cult, you know, uh, domesticated cattle, so uh, much less uh, uh, invaders. There's another claim, uh, David Pimentel at uh, Cornell uh, did a, a study where he claimed that there was $137 billion of yearly costs from in, invasive species in the US alone. Uh, it, that number is completely fictitious. I analyzed his paper. Uh, he, 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 he's doing things that I had seventh grade teachers who would never have let me get away with in a paper. In fact, uh, I recently used Pimentel's own methods of determining costs or benefits. I applied it to the zebra mussel, and I came up with $11 trillion of benefits. <laughs> so that shows you how bogus his, his methods are. The, the, the paper's a fraud. Okay. Uh, this is a direct scan from a, an article in the uh, scientific, it's a scientific publication. Uh, let's see, what is that? I can't read it. It's like Restoration Ecology, I think. This is peer-reviewed scientific literature. Okay, this is buckthorn. It's a shrub that is supposedly invading prairies and forests in the Midwest. Note what it says here. Research reveals that soil under buckthorn may be nitrogen-rich and devoid of soil microfauna. These are direct scans from the article. This is the buckthorn. You can see that it was colonized by the microarthropods faster. Uh, the, 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 these are the, the numbers each month. It reached higher populations than all of the native species except the cherry. Uh, these are the specific types of organisms. The Columbula and Mesostigmata reached higher densities under buckthorn in the buckthorn leaf litter than in any of the uh, any of the native species. And Shannon diversity is is comparable, slightly, very, very slightly lower. Shannon diversity is a mathematical measure of diversity in an ecosystem. Okay, once again, devoid of soil microfauna. When I read this, I, th I thought to myself, am I the only person on the planet that actually read this paper? <laughs> Did the authors even read it? And there was never a retraction from this peer-reviewed scientific journal. Okay, scientific misconduct. Uh, I think we should look to the law governing real estate and securities sales. Uh, misconduct includes false or misleading statements, the omission of material facts. A fact is material if it would alter a course of action. Now, if you omit material facts when you're selling real estate or securities, you're going to do jail time. I think it's time that we apply these fraud statutes to scientists and bureaucrats who omit material data, like the benefits of these species, when they are getting public money for, they're doing it for economic gain. Okay, extremism. You guys are on the front lines of dealing with this. I, I probably won't have anything new to tell you. Uh, you, you, most of you know that in Chicago, they've been cutting down forests. I love this cartoon. Okay, this is, uh, that's the, f the famous Monterey Cypress. Okay, the, this is Monterey Pine. These two stippled areas are the world's only natural stands of Monterey Cypress, just a few hundred acres. This would be a critically endangered species if it weren't naturalized elsewhere. Okay, these are uh, the three main stands of Monterey Pine. Here's Año Nuevo, Monterey, and then down uh, a little down south on the on the coast. These are just these are just tiny specks on the planet. They're there. In fact, there's there's a stand on the island out here. Okay, and so you know that they're trying to kill Monterey Pine over here in the East Bay. That's just 50 miles from the 
na native natural stands. So if that's an alien, what do we make of this? This is the, uh, the eastern white pine. This is its main distribution. But notice these little dots down here. These are, comp these are natural native stands of it, uh, another one of these disjuncts. So if these are native here, a thousand miles away, why is Monterey pine not native here? It's unconscionable for anyone to claim Monterey pine is not native here. Oh. Okay, I, guess, I guess I got one thing right for this crowd. Uh, OK, extermination programs are generally disasters. Uh, the Murex fire ant program actually, they, they sprayed pesticides over probably millions of acres. They actually killed the native ants, which allowed the fire ant to spread. It, it made the problem much worse. Uh, tiger mosquito spraying, I think that was the early 60s. They spent a billion dollars in our dollars spraying DDT all over the south and zero results. Gypsy moth spraying in the east caused local extinctions of butterflies. OK, the, this extremism, as, you, as we've seen, they're, they even kill native species. And I, I should, I should jump, jump in here and say I already dismantled native as a non-scientific concept. So when I use it here in this talk, I'm using it in the way it's generally uh, general, in the way the invasionists use it, but uh, I, I give no credence to, to that as a concept. Okay, so as you can see, they're killing native species. Uh, they're killing endangered species. Uh, they're killing uh, endangered echiums in, I think, New Zealand. The, the Monterey Cypress is being killed in South Africa, here in California, New Zealand, Australia. Uh, they, they have no problem killing endangered species. In fact, there's, I think there's a couple of others I mentioned here. Well, you don't need all the details. OK, this is another big sticking point. They actually are constantly opposing and thwarting efforts to naturalize in, endangered species in new safe areas. It's like the, uh, the stands of Monterey Cypress uh, that they're, they're killing, uh, I think, up, at, uh, up in San Francisco and in Marin. To me, those are the best case scenario for conservation. It's the naturalizing of an endangered species in a safe new habit, habitat. Uh, OK. Yeah, biodiversity has been likened to a library. They are the book burners in our libraries. OK, yeah, follow the money. Actually, OK, a couple more items before we get to that. Uh, the invasionists are actually trying to prevent the planting of native species within their range because they claim that if you say you plant a seed of a native species 100 miles away, it's it's not native there, even though the species is already present there. They claim it's genetic contamination, and they want to limit all plantings of natives to local seeds, not non... non uh, well, I can't speak to that. So they want to pro they're, they're proposing safe transfer zones where uh, someone, probably a fanatic, will decide how many miles you can legally move native species. Now, there's, there's no, no biological basis for this whatsoever. It's against, contrary to everything we know about the importance of genetic diversity and gene flow among populations. And in fact, as we speak, there are invasion jihadis who are killing all of the most robust and healthy members of a population of an endangered hemizonia in California because they claim they are genetically contaminated with non-local seed of that same species. Now, that shows that if you bring in non-local uh, genes, the species regains its strength and becomes healthier. I mean, that's, ins that's frankly insane. Okay, Australian invasionists have developed an immunocontraceptive genetically engineered organism. They've insert, inserted transgenes coding for the rabbit's egg coat protein into the myxoma virus genome. 
So this new type of myxomatosis makes the female rabbit infertile by her own immune system, attacks her, her, her eggs. The Australians also genetically modified the mouse pox virus so that it would be 100% fatal. And after publishing how they did this, they realized that because of the close similarity of a mouse pox to smallpox, the same method could be used to create a doomsday plague uh, for humanity from, from human smallpox. So to me, these are like the, these are the atom bombs of the invasionist war. So invasion biology isn't just a few native plant extremists going around spraying herbicide in the woods. It's, this, it's a very profoundly anti-life ideology and they're, they're, they are following this ideology to the farthest reaches of mass death. So I ask, what, at what point do they cross the line from being mere fanatics to being criminally insane? Okay, follow the money. The, the, uh, I think you guys will like this. Okay, this is a book uh, about uh, aliens, of course, forward by Bruce Babbitt. Okay, he was at a meeting. There were two guys from Dow and one guy from Monsanto, and I think I was the only enviro there. This was an anti-weed meeting. At one point, I asked one of the guys from Dow, what's your interest here? And he said, well, we just think if we can raise awareness of this issue, we'll sell more herbicides. <laughs> right. Nice that they're being honest about something for a change. And that same book says, how can a beautiful plant or sweet singing bird do more damage than a toxic waste dump or a developer's army of bulldozers? Uh, this is an, industri is an industrialist's wet dream where you indoctrinate the public to think that plants and birds are more dangerous than bulldozers. And imagine their glee when they find so-called environmentalists demanding that trees be clear-cut, demanding that wildlands are saturated with herbicides, this, would complete, this helps to discredit other environmentalists' calls for protecting trees and uh, protection against overuse of, of pesticides. Can I break in here for a moment? Sure. Okay. So, um, one of your, I think, arch enemies was brought up to me. There's a lot of hate stuff that goes on for anybody who dares speak out publicly against native plant restoration projects. So some of the hate mail I got <laughs> included um, dissing you terribly. I decided to look at the person, you know, and I thought, this is industry speak if ever I've seen it before, which I have so many times. And I looked up a reference um, here for an abstract of the International Weed Science Congress. And that uh, the very person, the person who had written to me had referenced somebody writing bad things about this gentleman here. And then I looked at that guy's associations and he had asked for some of his work to be published in the abstract of the International Weed Science Con Congress, and it was. And here we see under the sponsors, Aventus, BASF, uh, CNPQ, Dow AgroSciences, DuPont, uh, it goes on, FINEP, and um, oh boy, so many, it's just all these familiar names, Monsanto, Novartis, United Agri-Products, um, Zeneca. So, what he's saying, you can take a look at right here after if you're interested. And of my next slide, uh, Cal Epsi was the uh, California Exotic Pest Plant Council. I think they've not since changed their name. Sponsors, Monsanto, Dowie Lanco, Wilbur Ellis, CPRO, herbicide manufacturers. And I went to one of the Cal Epsi meetings. Here was a Monsanto booth. In fact, uh, one of the founding board members of Cal Epsi is, was Nelroy Jackson, who is a Monsanto employee. Uh, he was also on the National Invasive Species Advisory Committee. He is, quote, 
Product Development Manager for Monsanto Company with responsibility for the development of industrial turf and ornamental markets in California, Arizona, Nevada, and Hawaii. He has been instrumental in the development of Roundup and Rodeo herbicides for vegetation control in the West. He's an herbicide salesman. Okay, uh, there's, in fact, there's a whole uh, magazine about uh, killing these invasives, wildland weeds, charter advertisers, CPRO, Griffin, Dow AgriSciences, Brewer, Timberland, American Cyanamid, Helena, all herbicide manufacturers. I mean, how, how can we tolerate this kind of corruption of environmentalism? Okay, uh, corporations have been moving in to control the big environmental uh, organizations. World Wildlife Fund, uh, board, the board includes uh, the last CEO of Coca-Cola, former CEO of D DuPont, uh, another herbicide manufacturer, Nature Conservancy, PepsiCo, Hewlett Packard, Goldman Sachs, Conservation International, Robert Walton of Walmart. I mean, this is big business taking over big enviro. Uh, don't give your money to Big Enviro, give it to local people. And of course the corporate state, uh, FDA was a, FDA deputy commissioner here was a public policy at Monsanto, USDA uh, guy with food and agriculture, former director of Monsanto Center, uh, Elena Kagan in, on the Supreme Court, before she was there she argued before the Supreme Court for Monsanto against farmers. Uh, Islam Siddiqui, he was here in the California Ag Department for 28 years. He's a former uh, lobbyist, and now he's an Ag Trade representative. The corruption is so deep. In fact, I should remind you, this is Bastille Day. <laughs> People sometimes can affect a regime change. Okay, uh, yeah, th this is a part of the scary part of this. I had to cut out most of the slides just because they were too technical. Uh, okay, I analyzed the writings of an, in invasion biology, including the peer-reviewed scientific literature. These are structural commonalities you find with invasion biology and racist ideologies. All of these are common themes. I think I list 43 of them. Uh, this is all details, you really don't need to uh, uh, pay too much attention to. You, you can read my book if you want the, the full ugly, uh, ugly details. Okay, the same, the same images are used. This is a book uh, hyping the threat of the mud peoples to the immigrating to the United States, see the arrows. And this is a book on invasive species in South Africa, the same arrows. Now that may seem trivial, but when, when you study this and you see again and again the same phrases, the same images, like uh, they used to call uh, various, probably most races that have been vilified have been called a cancer in, this, in, the, in the society. Uh, and they, of course invasives are uh, called cancers. And uh, one of the most scary things is the, uh, I found these parallels between the ritual, uh, ritual parallels between the ritual burning of non-native weeds and the ritual elements found in lynchings of uh, African Americans. A guy did a big study of lynchings and he found they're a highly ritualized activity. And it, it was one of the scariest things in my book. All of those same elements are found in uh, restorationist rituals. So now we have to deal with that big scary N word, Nazi. Okay, this, it, like invasionists usually uh, say it's unfair to call them Nazis, but uh, German historians have actually traced the origin of invasion biology to the Third Reich. This is Adolf Hitler shaking the hand of Alvin Seifert. He was a uh, botanist whose job it was, was to organize teams of botanists to go around killing non-native species in Germany, cleansing the fatherland of the foreign. You know, it's like, I really wish this, this weren't true because then 
the invasionists wouldn't be harassing me for calling them Nazis, but it's like, you know, I'm really sorry about it. And invasion biology is actually currently being used by racist groups today. Uh, this is another nauseating exercise. You can go to the websites of uh, white supremacist groups and they're saying, oh, the environmentalists agree with us. This is genetic contamination. They are invasive species. Uh, it's, it, I mean, all, all of the same elements. And so, of course, yeah, those who seek easy answers get final solutions. Okay, and also, yeah, the, the genetic contamination part. Uh, I told you about the hemazonia that w where they were killing the most healthy and robust members of an endangered species because they were contaminated. I was at a meeting of the uh, Society for Conservation Biology. There was a special se session on restoration genetics. Uh, this stuff about genetic con contamination and local stocks is being promoted by people from Cold Spring Harbor. Now, most of you probably don't, yeah, most of you probably don't remember this, but Cold Spring Harbor was the original home of the Eugenics Rec Record Office, which was instrumental in creating the US involuntary sterilization and anti-race mixing laws. Those laws were then copied by Adolf Hitler and led to the Holocaust. Now, so we've used the N word, I, now I have to use the F word. These are facts. You can't sweep them under the rug. And it's, okay, so I'm sorry to have to cover unpleasant material like this. So if there's any invasionists here who object to my uh, exposing your dishonesty, your links with herbicide manufacturers, your links with racism and Nazi, Nazism, I'll make you a deal. If you stop lying about invasive species, I'll stop telling the truth about you. Okay. Oh, I'm already a, I'm a minute over time. Well, this, this should be pretty quick. Okay, pseudoscience. Uh, yeah, this great skeptic back in the 50s wrote a whole book on pseudoscience. He says, yes, it's amazing to see the extremes to which deluded scientists can be misled and the extremes to which they can mislead others. Uh, this is the sort of technical stuff, uh, invasion biology. It can't be a science because it doesn't operationally define its key terms, like we saw, native, alien. They, they don't even define invasion. They, they've been struggling with this for 50 years. Papers come out and they claim, oh, well, we have a new definition. Uh, they, they can't do it. They also can't define harm or natural. It's also based on uh, uh, discredited concepts, the balance of nature. I, I talked about that, right? Uh, no, no, nobody pays attention to that anymore in ecology. Co-evolved communities, uh, stability, climax communities, all of these are like ecological concepts from 50 years ago or more. And again, very important, there's no definition of harm. It, uh, in, in invasion biology, if, if a, an invading plant has little berries, they claim it's harmful because it's competing with native plants for dispersal by birds. But if it has no berries, it's harmful because it doesn't have food for birds. <laughs> it it kind of reminds me, I, I think it was one of the Black Panthers years ago said that if I stand, I am loitering. If I walk, I am prowling. If I run, I am fleeing. Okay, and this is more stuff for the academics that I uh, usually have to give this paper to. Um, more stuff about why in, in invasion uh, biology isn't, uh, is simply not valid. Uh, the, the, the stuff invasion biology gets away with would never be tolerated in, in any legitimate science. It, it's, it's a laughing stock. Okay, so summing up about the other side, yeah, these are just the, the, some of the nasty things that I've already covered. So what's the alternative? Integration biology. Okay, integration biology studies the, the processes of the dispersal 
and integration of species into new regions and, and the formation of new assemblages, new ecological reactions, I mean interactions. And the, uh, integration biology actually, if, if they would study these things objectively and without emotion and just observed what was going on, it has a tremendous potential to uh, teach us about the basic processes of ecology. And then, of course, my favorite, applied integration biology, the intentional dispersal of species to new areas. I I've been called the antichrist of invasion biology because uh, I, w I think it's our duty to spread species to new areas. I would love it if someone would naturalize platypus here in California. Uh, <laughs> And then, of course, at-risk species and clades. Uh, clades are like, okay, re okay, remember horses and camels. If they hadn't invaded other continents, when they became extinct here, we would have lost that whole branch of the tree of life. Now, nowadays, if we lose two species of elephants, the enti that entire group, the proboscidea, would be gone. Uh, if we lose a single species of ginkgo, we'll, that, that's, a, that's an extremely ancient branch of the tree of life. That will be gone forever. In fact, we should naturalize elephants in the tropical Americas yesterday. We, we need to do this. Both species of elephants are endangered. Uh, in fact, hippopotami have naturalized in the Amazon they, they escaped from a rich cocaine manufacturer's abandoned private zoo after he, after he got busted. And it, it, I mean, I think that's excellent. Uh, okay, now, now these really restricted clades, like elephants, there's only two species. It was formerly a, a, a huge, diverse group. So people think, well, okay, it's a relic. It can't rediversify. Uh, but, if you, but if you look at the past, uh, like the planktonic foraminifera, it's a little tiny things in the ocean. Uh, it was a big diverse clade. It crashed to just two species at the KT boundary. That's that, that giant extinction. Uh, amphibian and anthozoan uh, familial diversity crashed to extremely low levels in the Mesozoic, but all of these groups went on to re-diversify. Re so, Okay, the human population continues to expand. We're in the middle of an extinction, a major extinction event. This extinction event has actually been going on before human beings started uh, contributing to it because of the deteriorated climate and the, this cycle of ice ages that the planet has been trapped in for the last 1.7 to 2 million years. We're, we are accelerating this extinction. Now, eventually, uh, the human population will come back into a more sustainable level. It's our job is to get as many species and as many clades through that, that peak of extinction when human population peaks. Get it, we need to get it through the big crunch, as friends of mine call it. And if they can survive past our population peak, then they will probably be safe. When, when, when the, well, let's see, e, e, okay, they, they say that we're probably going to peak about 2050. I mean, who knows? The future is, is unwritten. Uh, when I think of the things that I never would have imagined when I was a kid that are surround me today, uh, who, who knows what's going to happen? But e, even after the peak, there will probably be, as like a flywheel effect, there will be residual extinctions uh, occur for a while after that. But I'd say probably about a thousand years from now, uh, things are going to be really cool, really cool. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, think long term. Th don't think short term. And especially I think about California, where again, all the smartest people in the world are, are moving here with all this brilliance and creativity. And it'll be so great. What sort of a great culture are we going to, go going to evolve in this, in this ferment of people and cultures? Uh, yeah, I always point out to people that, okay, we've been multicellular life for about a billion years. Uh, human beings are like, you know, a thousandth of that. 
the sun is expected to continue to give its gentle light for about another six billion years. It's like the party is just starting. I mean, the, 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 the extinction of the dinosaurs was only 60 million years ago. And, you know, look, look what is, has arisen and, you know, fallen to earth again in, the, in that period. I mean, there will be, in, imagine the parties we're going to have a couple of billion years from now. Okay, I think, yeah, I think that's it. That was the, my, the bu my book. It's almost out of print. I wish I had copies to sell you. And that's what we all love. And let's see. I so what are some other ways we could integrate integration biology into our lives? Uh, I think it's just a matter of, uh, like, take to, in your heart, you know, have a heartfelt relationship with all living beings. I mean, I remember Darwin said that uh, a disinterested love in all living beings is the most noble attribute of man. And, uh, you know, Native Americans often talk about all of our relations. Uh, it's like, you, first you put fear out of your heart, and you start respecting all living beings, and then you're able to see more clearly. If you've ever heard of blind hatred or blind fear, uh, once you get the fear out of your mind, then you can see things like the wild bees on the uh, star thistle. Uh, and also push academics to start to clean up their act. I mean, you know, the, the extreme language that I showed at the beginning of my talk, you find the same stuff in you know, peer-reviewed science, which is one indication that it ain't science.